robotics. We want robots to be part of the human world and have that interaction with humans. And so we dream of creating the helper robots of the future um, for people's homes, healthcare, but that's a really hard application. And so we're taking things a little step by step right now and starting with, let's call them simpler applications in the human world, such as security guarding, retail and food packaging, all of which we will see later on. I have plenty of videos and lots of media. So while robotics as a whole is full of hard problems, we're gonna start off by focusing on some of my favorite problems which came out of my PhD research, real narrow focused physical human robot interaction. So my guiding question really always comes back to how do we make physical human robot interaction safe? How do we make the application safe? How do we ensure that when robots collide, contact and crash into humans, that's as safe as possible? And so I tried my best to solve that during my PhD. And this is the guiding question that led me to create some really weird systems. And uh, we're going to explore a few. So the original idea of my research was to perform medical freehand ultrasound on human limbs using collaborative robots like the KUKA LBR. Um, but I soon realized that just the physical interaction between the probe and the human body was a very interesting problem in and of itself that needed a lot more attention. And so conceptually, pure motion control is not good enough. And tuning the controller and all the parameters needed for physical human robot interaction, it's not trivial. There are a lot of parameters to be tuned, everywhere from just your gains and the X, Y, Z and your rotations, all the way up to your stiffnesses and damping coefficients. And these are just the basics. There are many more that you can then tune even further. And so every body part or object has its own stiffness in its own way and properties that would need its own controller too. And I don't want to create a controller for necessarily every type of region of body for every surface and contact situation. So I thought this is an unstructured environment. How does the robot even know what's in contact with? And can I train models and use learning approaches to tell the difference between let's say a leg and a table or just a table by touch? How about the difference between a calf, knee, and ankle in different body regions? So for typical machine learning optimization approaches, you would typically collect a lot of trained data, apply it to a model, get some output, update the model, and repeat. The hard part about this for me was, where do I put my robot in the actual hardware and the actual hardware into this process? How, how do I get the hardware into the loop to really do in situ training? And one of the, the tough challenges, and this is a little trivial and me being uh, pedantic, was that the robot was based on like Java 1.6, a really old Java stack, but all the uh, machine learning and data science stack that's used today is all Python based. How do I get the two to interact with each other efficiently without me having to copy and paste and do a lot of manual processes between the two? So to solve the communications issue, uh, for me, gRPC was the answer. So now we're going to go deep into some technical implementation, talking deep about Python and networking and things like that. And so this allowed me to create a client-server model between the robot and my Python data science stack. And so the robot was essentially a server in the eyes of the data models and the training algorithms. And so the function callbacks from the optimization loops would actually call blocking server functions on the robot, which would make the robot move or do something physical. And so the return value from these function callbacks was the actual data collected from the robot's onboard sensors, like the force sensors and the torque sensors. And so this allowed us to do robot in the loop optimization. And so for those not familiar with gRPC, we define our service using a language neutral profile that then can be, it auto generates boilerplate code in basically every language. And so in this case, I use Java and Python for the robot and for my data science stack. And it's a lot of fun because it integrates nicely with CICD and you're going to see a reoccurring theme. I really believe in CICD and continuous integration development, both from data science side of things, both from an experiment side of things, but even up to when we get to the Holodi robotics and uh, how we do our, our development, everything from the mechanical engineering to the software engineering is all about continuous integration, continuous deployment, and always getting to the next step. And so in this case, all my services and code bases can be used, can use the same core profile and share that interface across all parts of the stack. And so first, in this case, we define the service that contains a set of functions we'd like to call from our client. In this example, we have a robot service that has a move command. It requires an array of joints as input and returns a session result message with all the data. And so these, these messages objects are defined here. Um, 
On the Python side, and this is the data science app, we simply define a class for our client with the service stub boilerplate. And this lets us connect directly to the robot and sort of ignore a lot of the, the, the technical details of how to do connections between the two. For the actual training and optimization for those in machine learning, you're going to recognize a lot of this. This is just an objective function. We could call the robot as if it was simply a function provider as part of essentially like gradient descent or some optimization loop. And this calls the robot through the controller's client class and calls the services whenever we need it. And this is so this is an example of using SciPy, one of the standard libraries out there for optimization and mathematics in the Python ecosystem. And so the robot is simply part of the optimization loop and part of the optimization function, having the robot run a motion session within that function. And so the result of the session may contain a bunch of data from the robot that we get to then evaluate into a single float value for the optimization that we're trying to minimize. And so this is the fun part now. So this is where it comes into real life. The human body, it's a deformable surface. It's an unstructured environment. And this is a safety concern and a challenge for trajectory planning and control. Um, I was trying to optimize using everything we just saw there for the smoothest bounce-free motion essentially along a limb while performing medical ultrasound. And so to tune the parameters, I use differential evolution with the robot in the loop. And each time the evaluate fitness step is run that we saw before, the actual robot with the Java controller was called from the SciPy optimization function through gRPC to run a session with a given set of vector, a given vector of motion parameters, let's call it. And it responds to the Python data stack with a session result filled with the force sensor data that is then converted to a single float measure, fitness or quality. Basically, let's look for bounce-free motion. And so hardware in the loop for standard data science. And so through real world sessions with a collaborative robot, the framework was able to tune the motion control for optimal and safe trajectories along the human leg phantom. And so hundreds of sessions were performed and generations of candidate solutions were developed. And finally, we have here the results of this particular experiment, just smooth ultrasound motion across a human leg. And so from this experiment design perspective, the big win with something like this is that I can simply set it and forget it. The hardware is able to train itself. If I had a collection of robots, I could have a room full of robots automatically training themselves to adapt to all these different situations, letting the application scale. It collects all the data on its own. It runs the sessions on its own. And this leads me to one of the silliest and potentially stupidest, but a lot of fun experiments I designed. Um, I programmed the robot to poke automatically. And so I had it to learn how to poke. And so in robot medical ultrasound, it's an, it's an example of a task where simply stopping the robot upon contact detection, like you would typically do in a lot of industrial scenarios where if it makes human contact, you just have the robot stop and then you reset the robot. In medical ultrasound, that's not an appropriate reaction strategy because you get into a clamping situation and you don't want to clamp a human to a medical table. And so the robot should have an awareness of body contact location to properly plan force control trajectories along the human body. So here I made a framework for the robot contact classification using the force sensor data. And so I want to build a classifier model that answered the question, what was involved in the contact event? Not if a contact event occurred. We know that from the force data, but really what was in contact? And so to gather the data to train this classifier, the robot was programmed to poke, basically, until a force condition was triggered. And using the force feedback, we would train the model as the input vector. And I had several different scenarios, everything from thigh, knee, calf, ankle, table, and free space. And so all of this was built on the same communications architecture, where the Python data science and machine learning stack treated the robot as a server with a callable functions through the gRPC. And once again, for me, the big win with something like this is that I could simply set it and forget it, letting the robot train itself, let it collect the training data for me, really making my life easy, honestly. And I can also easily test my code by mocking the robot and having the robot server be a mock test function, essentially, from the client's perspective. And this allows for a wonderful separation concerns between my robot code base and my training machine learning code base, not having it all tied together as a giant monolith. And so back to the application, on the machine learning side, we tuned Psychic Learn for this uh, particular example with a simple quick effective pipeline. 
and just a half second of single access force status and basic pre-processing steps and the decision tree, we were able to have the robot know what was involved in the contact event, not just that a collision occurred. And so this code is quite simple too. Uh, this is basically it in a lot of ways. Psychic Learn makes it really easy and trivial to create basic pipeline to test ideas and really get to your next demo, get to your next concept. Um, and so we branched the pipeline with multiple pre-processing steps and it let us test our hypothesis quickly and effectively without having to build up whole neural networks and things like that. Beyond the machine learning applications, I've really enjoyed using this, this technique of hardware and loop for even just calibrating robots. Um, using gRPC and the hardware, a variety of applications with Faro laser trackers, we're able to just have the robot automatically dance through its workspace and create a point cloud for basic accuracy calibration. And so that's why I love this architecture because it brings the hardware into the loop. It's scalable, it's testable. Every time we want to add a new device, we just create a gRPC wrapper around it. And now all these devices become abstract servers that provide a set of callable functions to a client. I don't have to worry about all this weird connectivity. The client doesn't need to know about what they are, how they're implemented. It makes it great for testing and mocking. And the hardware controllers don't need to know anything about the machine learning, data science, or the application stuff. They just focus on being hardware, on being machines. They do what they do, they do their motions, and they just submit whatever data is done at the end of their motion uh, session. And so all my interfaces can also stay versioned and in sync with auto-generated boilerplate and profiles that can be created through CI/CD. use things like Git sub modules to tie it all together, which is a lot of fun. And so from a hardware engineering perspective, my experiment design and setup time is greatly reduced and through automation and the well-defined interface. And so now we get into the fun stuff. So that, that was my exploration uh, through the PhD work and really discovered, all right, there is a very deep problem in human robot interaction in physical human robot interaction, contact detection, and how really that, that, that physical interface between human and robots work. And so, um, we were exploring in my PhD how to make the interaction as safe as possible. Now we're with Hello Robotics, I get the opportunity to explore the limits of bringing robots into the human world and push these boundaries even further to explore not only physical human robot interaction, but robot interaction in the human world. And what kind of tasks can we do with this humanoid form? And so Hello Robotics has been around about six years now primarily focusing on R&D markets. We've been working with DeepMind, NASA, JPL, the IHMC, Toyota Research Institute, ETH Zurich. And we, so we sell a humanoid robot platform that's capable, capable of doing almost everything that a research lab would want to do as part of the research. It's a mobile robot, it's self-balancing, it's based on ROS, so you can be able to do all your machine learning and computer vision connection and research all with one platform. And so this made it very affordable and capable for the research labs. And so they could essentially purchase one or two of these and do all their research with it. We are now at about 40 plus employees uh, from about 10 different countries. We're a very diverse and international team. Um, We've started establishing offices in multiple regions of the world in order to be able to reach the most amount of people that we'd wanna work with. So we have offices, the headquarters is in Norway, my North American headquarters in Canada. We also have branch offices in the US and Italy. And so specifically, our current platform is called EVE. It's a human-sized robot, about 185 centimeters tall. It's designed as a, like a human in terms of size and strength, reachability. Uh, it's designed to be intrinsically safe from the ground up around people and objects. You have onboard vision. It's battery, so you, can, uh, you have full mobility. Uh, it's fully self-balancing. There's 23 degrees of freedom. We actually design our own motors from the ground up. We believe that the motors that we're that were already on the market weren't good enough for physical human robot interaction and collaboration. And so compared to, for instance, a KUKA LBR, um, a lot of your industrial robots have very large transmission ratios. So while we're able to do um, impedance control and force control with these types of robots now that they're filled with sensors, there's, there's a high reflected inertia due to the high transmission ratio. So that's really great for precision and stiffness-based tasks. But when you're trying to do this impedance control and take using your torque signal back from your end effector to get your compliance, it has low bandwidth and can't really keep up all the time with human interaction. So it doesn't feel natural. And this natural has large implications on safety. 
Comparatively, we have our Revo motors, which are the highest torque to weight ratio motors, direct drive motors on the market right now. And so we can have basically natural force impedance control with a low reflected inertia and a very high bandwidth. And this makes interaction with the robot feel very natural, leading to a safer application. And so if you remember from some of my PhD work I did before, it brings up the idea of safety in the context of different events. A lot of robot applications, simply stopping the task is a terrible idea because you get into a clamping scenario. And so for instance, with the KUKA LBR robot, if you simply stop the probe, yeah, you're clamping the human, but the human can also not back drive the robot due to that high transmission ratio. And so this is not a safe scenario at all for humans in loop, it's very dangerous. With our robot, because everything is direct drive, because our transmission ratios are almost one to one, and we use a capstan rope pulley system, everything is back drivable. And so this allows us to create a holistic, safe robot application from the ground up, from intrinsic design on the robot side to the extrinsic design on the application side. And so back to our mission and our vision, we as a company want to explore how robots can be part of the human world instead of changing the world for robots. As I mentioned before, this is very different than industrial robots, where when you build the smart factories, you build it for the robots, you sort of forget about the humans at a certain point. And so we can only grow so big by selling one or two robots to R&D labs. And so over the past year or so, we've been transitioning over to the applications domain, really exploring how our robot can be part of the human world and what applications would bring most value to end users. Now, our dream for the company is home and healthcare. We, I wake up every morning looking to build the robot of the future that can be in people's homes, in hospitals, in nursing facilities, being helpers, aides, uh, nursing assistants. But that's a, it's a very difficult problem. Lots of unstructured environments, lots of risk, lots of dynamic environments constantly changing. Lots of non-expert users would be running around the robot creating safety concerns. And so this, this is typically years away. And just even from my experience in the biomedical domain 10 or so years ago, it's, it's a very difficult domain to even get like certifications in. But earlier this year, we closed our Series A funding round. And with that, we landed sh three strategic investors who are also project partners. And they gave us access to domains and applications that we are using as stepping stones towards that future goal of home and healthcare. And so this is where some of the fun videos start. So in North America, we've partnered with ADT Commercial Security Group to explore security guarding uh, where, for example, the robot can patrol hallways at night, check if doors are locked, um, you know, pick up leftover items that might be in the way that might be a tripping hazard or a security hazard. It's essentially a really smart video camera with manipulation capability. And so here's an example of the executive vice president, Dan of ADT, presenting our robot to the to the world essentially, it was announced on LinkedIn the other day. Here's my application engineer, Christopher, using the VR control that we also have for the robot so that you can see through the robot's eyes and interact with the robot through the world. And so we like to think of things as a, a human in the loop is still an important part of the process. There's lots of things we can automate the robot, we can automate patrols, it can navigate things. We can automate some basic manipulation. But there are going to be lots of things that maybe we can't automate it yet. And so we like to bring the human in the loop for those things as we start to build up with machine learning and all that type of stuff, more and more applications and uh, processes that can be automated. Uh, basically taking the 80-20 the rule in the way, like what is the 20% we can do right now really well that covers 80% of the applications and start to build that later and later. You can even see here, safe around humans he's going to fist bump the robot everything is very natural you'll see a little back drivability when the fist bump happens let's wait for it there we go there we go the robot self-balancing maintains balance even when external forces are interacting on the robot all right in sweden and norway we partnered with a company called strongpoint they're a retail solutions provider who provides um, like the backend systems for retail and grocery stores uh, in the Baltics and Scandinavia. And so this covers everything from click and collect lockers to the, like, the ERP and inventory management systems. And they see our robot as sort of being the front end to that, where can we close the loop to this application where if a client purchases an item online using the mobile app, can the backend system summon a robot in the store to pick up the items, 
bag the items and bring it to a click and collect locker for the human to then uh, pick up their groceries in an automated fashion. And so this is a very closed loop ecosystem for automating the retail space. It could even, the inventory management system could summon the robot to restock shelves as needed. It's, it's really about holistic vertical integration, making sure that the whole stack of the application has little key value points that could really bring you know, financial success and cost reductions to the end users. I think we're near the end of the road movie. Yeah. And, and so what's also fun about this is the robot could work through the night. It could work at any point, always restocking shells, always setting things up, collecting data, everything from maybe even the temperature in different regions of the grocery store um, to looking for misplaced items on random shells. Very closed loop application uh, with the robot. And so in Italy, we've partnered with a company called Altopack. They're a food packaging machine manufacturer. So about 95% of all Italian food, uh, so your pasta, your risotto, and things like that that come out of Italy, is packaged on an Altopack machine. Um, and so they wanted to explore using our robot in a very industry 4.0 type application, doing machine tending, where our robot would be but beside the machine, putting in the raw materials, collecting the things on the output, maybe doing some maintenance during the machine's downtime. But what they're really excited about is they have the, their machines all around the world for food packaging. And especially during COVID, they weren't able to fly their Italian engineers to these different locations to perform maintenance, do inspections, and work with the local technician. And so by having these robots in multiple locations with their machines and using the VR control, they can enter into an avatar mode where they sort of, the, the engineers in Italy, could teleport into these robots in various locations and see what the robot sees, hear what the robot hears, interact with the world through the robot, perform inspection, perform maintenance using the robot, work with local technicians to do training and things like that. And this, this, lets, um, this allows for a much more efficient and convenient application with the robot. Uh, in this space. This also extends to the security guarding world. Can we have robots patrolling every floor of a building? And then uh, if a security event is detected, can we have a remote operator somewhere else in the building, somewhere else in the country, somewhere else in the world even, at like an operations center, put on a VR headset and teleport into that robot to resolve the security event? And so now you don't have the the typical situation of a security guard potentially running up and down stairwell to get to the next floor where a security event might occur, you can already have robots on site closing the loop much quicker and, and then bringing the human in the loop when the human is most valuable, but using the robot for what it's most valuable, which is really the repetitive, boring tasks. There we go. We are also finalists in the X Prize for uh, Avatar Robotics. We're working with the iBotics Consortium to really push the boundaries of where there might be more than just a, a typical VR experience, but VR becomes haptics, it becomes immersive. And so working with our a team in the Netherlands, we've developed a full haptic rig for the robot where you become the robot essentially in every way, seeing through the eyes of the robot, feeling the robot, getting that force feedback. There's even heaters around the robot so you sense the temperature of the robot. And so on the right, we have a colleague in the Netherlands uh, controlling the robot remotely 800 kilometers away with our team in Norway on the left there in the office, um, interacting with things, working in the kitchen environment. And you can see through the, the eyes of the, uh, the robot on the bottom right over here. Everything from interaction, immersive uh, remote presence, uh, working with tools and other items in the kitchen, we're able to overlay um, the actual vision part with a 3D render of the environment as well to give the person a little more per uh, perception of the environment around them. Wow, a lot of people are still joining. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to do these these uh, challenges of interacting with the human role, because you really start to discover that not everything in the human world is necessarily designed well for accessibility. Uh, how much time is left? I think that's good. All right. So beyond these applications, I mentioned earlier before, we have the vision of home and health care, and we really want to create the helper robot of tomorrow. 
And so this extends to robots that might be in people's offices helping out around there. It might extend into nursing homes where we can have the robot be an assistant doing a lot of the repetitive tasks uh, in a security situation, working with humans to guide them in the dark in an accessibility setting, being able to reach places that the humans can't reach due to accessibility issues. This, this really is all focused on being a helper robot, a collaborative robot, where physical human robot interaction extends beyond just repetitive industrial tasks, really bring the robot out of the factories and into the human world. So from a kinematics point of view, we, if we want to build a proper helper robot, we need to interact with the human world like humans do. We need to design the robot from the ground up to be able to react and inter interact with any object or handle or whatnot that would be in the reachable human space. And so this is why for us, a humanoid design is the optimal design because we're able to reach all these areas. If we built basically an R2-D2 robot, we probably wouldn't be able to reach uh, most of the areas that humans interact with. Uh, there are dog type robots that are out there on the market with arms coming off the back that aren't able to reach a lot of and work with handles and doorknobs and things like that, that humans would typically be able to interact with. And so that is why our approach is humanoid. And so we believe in a future of collaborative robots that includes humans in the loop. And so here's an example of a security guarding demonstration that we did for a commercial partner, ADT uh, in the US. And so many applications can be made more effective by having humans and robots working together. And the goal is to leverage the capabilities of both types of workers, using the robots for what robots are good at, which is just repetitive, continuous tasks, and using humans with, for what humans are good at, which is that more creative side of things, the um, things you can't really train machine learning on. And this is a perfect example of Maybe we come across a door that is stuck with an unintended bag. So that's a security situation, an event that maybe we did not program in our machine learning models. But if the robot detects an event that it has been programmed for, we can then summon a robot, a human to bring it into the loop, put on the VR headset, and really resolve that event in the most efficient way possible, then go back to autonomous mode on the robot. And that is it for that video. And so a lot of people ask me, what does it look like to see through the robot right now? And so this is an example of some VR um, uh, testing that we were doing recently. Uh, when you're in the avatar mode, you see through the uh, 3D vision system. Uh, in this particular example, we also have, a, it's a little, there's a bit of a ghosting effect because we have a bit of a point cloud overlay that we were experimenting with in this test. And we're currently using the Unity game engine as a dev development platform for this VR control. And so you really start to see that in order to do this type of robotics, we need everything from mechanical engineering to software engineering, electrical engineering, game developers, full stack developers. There's really a little bit of everything that goes into this. Um, we also like to do a lot of testing in our office. We test, 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 and do it as often as possible with our people around us. And so having our testing perform up and down in natural human spaces, having our people on a continuous basis interacting with our robot and really um, pushing the robot, pushing the interactions to the limits so that we're always sure that with what we're doing, uh, safety is always being tested and is always being ensured. And it's a lot of fun the first time you, you shake the hands of the robot, you feel that natural high bandwidth, low reflected inertia uh, with the whole motor transmission system. And uh, I think we saw this video before, but yeah, the robot, the robot is always there. In this case, actually, the robot was being controlled, I think, from the Netherlands, and we were doing like an office tour through the robots. Instead of, we weren't able to fly our friends into the office and have them visit. So we had them put on some VR goggles and they visited the team uh, by driving around the robot. Uh, in the office. Uh, I actually, as a, my first experience with seeing the team in Norway as well, was I went into VR mode, controlled the robot around, and just, you know, poked different people, poked my new colleagues, and uh, got to talk to them through the robot and uh, interact with the office through the robot, which is a lot of fun. From a computer vision world, um, people ask me, oh, what kind of machine learning are you doing? What kind of computer vision are you doing? Uh, do you need to do things like um, facial recognition, all that? Not really from the facial recognition side, but for us, object detection and posed estimation, and, you know, general perception 
are the important features that we need for robotics. We need the robot to understand its environment. We need the robot to know where the humans are, what orientation are the humans in, especially if we want to do things like behavioral gestures and nonverbal communication. It would be pretty stupid if the robot wanted to wave at a human, but the human was facing the other way, and so the human wouldn't see it. Or if it waved at the human, but the robot was facing the wall next to it because it didn't have the proper vectors lined up in, and the proper pose estimation with the other actors in the room. And so a lot of our work goes around this for both for both the behavior side of things, for from a navigation side of things, and just a general interaction side. And in terms of object detection, what we might think on the engineering side is really simple applications like um, object detection using, for instance, this was used with YOLO. Um, this is this is fantastic for a lot of security applications because this, this is all the information they need. Was the bag detected? Yes or no. Was that bag left in a room after I've done several patrols of the facility? These are all things that while it might be simple for engineers and machine learning developers it has a lot of value in the real world and that's that's really our goal is to enter the real world and find the little things that robotics machine learning computer vision can bring value to step by step and so that covers my presentation thank you very much for having me here today it's a lot of fun uh, you can contact us at hello robotics over twitter or see our website we have lots of job openings so if there's if this is something that interests you, if you want to be part of the adventure of pushing the boundary of humanoid robots forward, uh, we have job openings from mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, six different software development positions, um, game developers, a little bit of everything, and with positions located in different parts of the world. It's a lot of fun. Um, and you could come see me on my website. I have links to all my other profiles there as well, links to my publications if you're interested in reading more on some of my work. And you could always find me on Twitter as well. So thank you very much. If the participants have any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask. Yeah, to I am going to open the chat if you want to type questions or, um, yeah. So you could you could send the questions in the chat or uh, I guess unmute yourself and ask me a question and uh, I will try my best to answer it. Yeah. So, am I, am I audible? Yep. Hello there. Yeah. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, my name is Gautam. Uh, so, I just wanted to ask you is there any reason why you went for the humanoid type of robots uh, instead of like fleet robots? Uh, yeah. So, humanoid robot, I'm going to go back a couple slides. Um, the number one reason is uh, which slide was it? Uh, no. Yeah, this one. The number one reason is interaction with the human world. So the human world was designed for humans. Everything for, for in terms of accessibility to where our buttons for elevator buttons are located to where handles are um, is really defined by humans and our reachability, our human our anthropomorphic kinematics, if you will. And so with the humanoid robot design, we can also interact with the world in the same way that humans would instead of having to come in and change everything in an environment in order for the robot to be able to act with it. So I, I've done a lot of work in like robot integration, like the traditional like industrial robot world, industry 4.0 type stuff. And when you want to start bringing robots into the mix, if you let's say you want to do machine tending on the CNC machine, you get a universal robot or something. You then have to make start making mounts and different grip points and all that in the human environment so the robot could be useful. And we we want to be able to deploy our robots to arbitrary locations like people's homes and things like that without them having to change anything. We don't want to have them having to create and put things in different locations so that the robot could reach it. We don't want them to have to, you know, put different handles on things so the robot could grip it. We want our robot to already be capable intrinsically of interacting with that human world. And so that, that's why a humanoid design lets us get there Maybe maybe it's an easier way of getting there, but for us, it's a much more efficient way of getting there. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, just to continue on the same, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so to continue on the same question, so the whole purpose of your uh, particular robot is to do the miscellaneous activities of household. So, so that that is our dream. Our dream and our like, let's call it the five to ten year plan for the company is home and healthcare. And having a robot that is capable of entering people's homes and hospitals and being assistance. So, if you've ever like Star Wars, like like a CP three O, or uh, if you ever watched the Jetsons, a cartoon back in probably the eighties or nineties. Um, there is the Rosie, the, the, the nursing, the sort of like the maid robot that would help people clean around the house and things like that. That's our real dream because we can then start um, addressing the labor shortage in the world. We can then start helping people and, you know, doing the things that are maybe low value to humans and letting the humans do more high value things. Uh, about that, so is there any interaction between robots and human in your uh, particular device? Yeah, so so we have we have um, so in home and healthcare, it could be everything from, uh, for instance, uh, if we go back a couple videos ago. Uh, well, in this case, uh, the robot would be interacting with humans from a security guarding context. Uh, so everything from hey, maybe I need to check your ID, show me your ID, being able to pick up badges and things like that. Um, if we go back this one, where the robot is helping uh, a disabled human be able to pick up things out of a shelf that they can't reach. And so the human and the robot are working together to achieve an end goal and task um, to just shaking hands and working with humans in the world, real world. Imagine if the, the robot was maybe collecting items for cooking, so preparing everything, and then the human is doing the actual chopping and they could work together to prepare a meal. Uh, maybe the robot could one day unload a dishwasher and things like that. Those are the types of challenges that we want to tackle. Um, how much? So in the chat, I have another question. How much impact do you think AI can cause on employment? As recently, major major companies are decided to go automated and come here, especially in India with high population rising unemployment rates. So AI, AI is a very broad topic. Uh, there is a lot of AI in the world. There's not a lot of useful AI in the world, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of, let's call it, um, repetitive tasks being automated. And so that's what we're probably going to see is a lot of tasks that are repetitive, that, um, are, are potentially dangerous, that are, um, we're trying to minimize the cost around. Those are most likely the first tasks that will be automated. And so this includes things like picking and placing to like packaging, uh, restocking shelves in the grocery store is a good example of very, very repetitive tasks that humans are doing right now because uh, we are very good at unstructured environments. We can pick up five different boxes and quickly orientate the boxes to place in the shelf uh, with different shapes and geometries and softnesses and thicknesses and things like that. Uh, humans aren't good at that yet, but we're getting slower and slower there. And so we're going to see that there's going to most likely be a shift where humans will be um, becoming more part of creative tasks, more dynamic tasks, more higher value tasks, while robots might, and AI, let's call it, might start taking over the lower value tasks, the repetitive tasks, the dangerous tasks, the tasks that cause us a lot of injury, actually. One example in the food packaging world is there's a, currently a human that is just doing this with boxes eight hours a day, and this really should be automated because there's a lot of lower back problems that can occur in this context. Um, if we look back at my PhD work, one of the driving um, questions I didn't really talk about during this presentation, but why I did medical ultrasound was because sonographers, the type of doctor that performs ultrasound, they have the highest rate of carpal tunnel syndrome in their industry. And so a lot of them have to retire early because their risks are suffering from carpal tunnel due to the repetitive motions of performing ultrasounds all day long during their career. And so now if we can have a robot perform the repetitive task and the human can focus on the diagnostics, the, the human to human interaction in the medical situation, we've, we've reduced potential injury. We've re increased um, the outcome, the, the quality of life and the outcome for the doctor. We've increased the quality of the actual medical procedure because robots are a lot more accurate and precise with following trajectories for this medical imaging. So your medical imaging comes out potentially more crisp, more clear, and you have with better imaging, you might be able to do better diagnostics. And so the end user has a better outcome. We're really trying to find those key value tasks 
that have benefits across the whole stack, let's call it, the full vertical integration from end user to end user. Um, does the intersection of the robot to humans are autonomous or man controlled? Uh, the inter interaction of the robot to humans are autonomous or man controlled? So a bit of both. There are a lot of things we do that's man controlled and by man controlled, let's call it VR mode. Um, so some of the things that we saw here was completely automated. So for instance, like picking grocery, uh, so this is right, this example completely automated. Uh, so the robot detected the box. It goes down, bends down to pick up the box. It plans the hand's trajectories to grip the box, picks it up, finds the surface to place it on, and places it. Um, in another example, here patrolling a building completely automated. But then there is an example of when the um, the security operator puts on the goggles and picks up the bag. That's the VR mode. So that's bringing the human into the loop for some tasks that we haven't necessarily programmed yet because they're more complicated. They're more dynamic. Um, other examples, not going too far, I'll go the other way. Um, yeah, I want this, I want the end here. So this is the example of, well, this is VR mode. So this is completely human controlled, but the robot, the robot still, so even though the human is doing the VR control and let's call it overlaying motions on that, the robot is still self-balancing. And so a lot of times your VR control is sort of just a suggestion to the robot's full body controller because the number one priority for the robot's controller is stay balanced, um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, all right, I'm going to go. So I see there's some questions in the chat. I'm going to jump over to the actual queue, answer some um, verbal questions, and then go back to the chat. So uh, top of the list is Gautam. Gautam. Uh, yeah. Yeah, hi. So yeah, I find uh yeah, I find the work that you do really interesting. So especially the you know ultrasound scanning, uh, because I've also worked on uh, a similar thing earlier, and uh, it was just a six-axis uh, uh, robot, which it, it was not a humanoid type, but it's just yeah. something which is driven uh, by uh, belts, uh, belts. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I worked in that space, and uh, then I went on to work in uh, uh, like autonomous uh, fleet robots, uh, you know, which does navigation and mapping, and they use a lot of SLAM. And yeah. uh, currently, I'm working on uh, uh, VR. And, uh, I'm working on medical uh, simulation using VR. So, is it possible to get in touch with you later and we really discuss uh, whatever I've done? Yeah, for sure. So, so for anyone who wants to get in touch, uh, here take a. Let me go to actual thing. On the last slide here, uh, you have my contact info. On my website, you have access to also my LinkedIn and everything like that. Just add me to LinkedIn. Add me to Twitter. Uh, those are typically the best ways to get in touch. Um, same thing with the Holiday Robotics. We have uh, holidayrobotics.com/careers, or you could also see the link off our main page. Um, we have all our open positions. Navigation is one of those open positions. VR development is one of those open positions. We also have a general applications um, uh, place to apply. So if you don't find a job that fits exactly your background, submit an application to our general applications um, button, and that lets you tell us what you think your your ideal role is. And we've actually hired a lot of people to do that because we don't know every role that we need. And some people propose us jobs that were like, oh, wait, yeah, that'd be a great type of role to have. And so we, we build uh, new jobs like that sometimes. Um, uh, yeah, and I'll be starting my master's next year, uh, but it'll be in Finland. So is it possible to apply for jobs um, in Norway from there? Yeah, so we do have some remote work. It depends on the job. Uh, if you're doing like a mechanical engineer, it helps to be very close to Norway to like actually work on the hardware. Uh, but there's some software jobs that are that can be remote. It really depends on the job. Finland's close, and I know some of the Scandinavian countries have uh, tax treaties that are able to um, be able to work across multiple countries and like do the income yeah. tax in a special way. So that that's all implementation details. But uh, I, I, I just reach out and that uh, we can look into things. Uh, Dikshita, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, you got it right. Hi, Nicholas. This is Dikshita. Uh, I'm currently uh, pursuing specialization in biomedical engineering. So uh, 
I think what all the work that you're doing is wonderful. Really, really loved all the work that you're doing. And since I'm an Indian, it really, um, you know, was curious to me that in India, there are many, many places which uh, lack a lot of medical support. And especially in medical technology, it's pretty weak in most of the rural yeah. areas. So how cost friendly would it be for all these areas to receive these kind of technology? Yeah, so I think there is sort of a similar question in the chat I saw pop up before. The current robot, the EVE platform, it's it's a little more expensive, so it's, it's not cost effective. And that's why we're really trying to explore the applications and build the applications. So what I didn't really talk about is our project development with these pilot partners. We're doing it very agile. We have the client in the loop with our development. We're deploying these research and development platforms to these applications. In parallel, our design team is designing the next generation robot with a focus on cost, cost and weight optimization. And what we'll be going towards is more of a robots as a service type model where um, it won't become a CapEx cost. So hospitals, people's homes, they won't have to pay a lot of money for the robot. They'll pay basically like a subscription fee, if you will, for the robot. And so the, the value of the, the reoccurring fee, robots as a service or like software as a service is tied directly to the value of their application. And so especially like in North America, we have a nurse, nursing shortage. COVID especially taught us that. And also from a safety point of view, we can have robots going up and down hallways helping people without having to have the interaction um, with other humans, which creates dangerous situations during pandemics where you might have transmission of disease and things like that. We can equip the robot, let's say with a UV germ killer um, as it goes up and down the hallways. We can have the robot do the initial checks for um, temperature checks as people are coming in so we don't have to expose humans to dangerous situations uh, while still working uh, in these situations. So as, as you mentioned, um, nursing, hospitals, the goal is in the next generation of robots and the next generation of the company's development to bring the cost down low enough to make robots as a service accessible enough such that we can access all stratas of society, all um, areas of the world, to, to really help with the shortages in labor, in skill, in personnel, in people, in repetitive tasks, taking humans out of the dangerous situations. Uh, there was an example we spoke with recently of a nuclear facility where just bringing um, robots, uh, instead of having to send a robot in to do an inspection on a nuclear uh, site, if you send a robot in, it brings it really helps with the safety of things. Um, I'm gonna jump on to some chat questions and i'll be back to the verbal questions all right i'm going to start from the last uh who has raised their hands to uh all right automation is already placed in many jobs from bank tellers to taxi drivers in the future is it time to think about making laws protect some of these industries yeah uh, the, well yeah that's politics um i will try my best to be as ethical of an engineer as possible but politics and laws that's something we can promote as engineers to the best of our abilities. Um, we will always create more and more technology. You can't really stop technology and the creation of technology. Progress will happen. Um, but unfortunately, that's outside the scope of a lot of our work is we need to we need to call on our governments and our politicians and our elected officials to do better by our people and to make sure that as technology progresses, that humans are also considered. Um, Will this robot be cost effective? So I, I talked about that. We're really trying our best in our next generation of robots to bring down the cost and make it accessible. The goal is if, if we want to build helper robots, it has to be cost effective. If we don't make it cost effective, then we're not doing our job as engineers. Uh, what advice would you give current students, especially those in branches of mechanical and electrical computer science, who wish to build a career in robotics? So this, this is actually fun. I have on my website a couple of blog posts about what, what I wish I told myself back when I was doing the thing. So I come from mechanical and biomedical. I spent the first 10 or so years of my career um, building medical implants and uh, doing things like that on the biomedical and me pure mechanical engineering side. Programming, and especially learn for me, learning Python, but just learning programming in general was the number one thing that let me branch out of pure mechanical engineering. Um, doing hobby projects as, at home with Raspberry Pis and setting up little micro servers and things like that. That was a lot of fun. It let me build up a lot of skills and it let me see the world from a different perspective. Mechanical engineering is very, it's a very old type of engineering, a very waterfall technique. 
software engineering, very dynamic, very new. Everything is changing every day. Agile methodologies are being built and destroyed every day. And so being able to merge a lot of my learnings from the software side to my mechanical side was a lot of fun. We actually apply it sort of right now at the company as well. We try and we try and do sprints and very agile continuous integration and deployment in the hardware team as well, where every two weeks we 3D print all the things that have been designed, sort of doing a demo day and a integration testing on a regular basis instead of design, 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 eventually send out to for manufacturing and only find out six months later that the part didn't fit. So branching out into parallel disciplines is really great, especially for robotics, because robotics really is the merger of software, electrical, and mechanical engineering. So having, I like my engineers to have full stack knowledge. So you should have a basic understanding of electrical, mechanical, and software engineering, but be specialized. I uh, Generalists, people who are like a jack of all trades, they're really good in startups at the beginning, but startups and a lot of companies grow out of that very quickly. So like, for instance, right now, I'm hiring pure mechanical engineers. I, I expect a lot of my mechanical engineers to not be experts in robotics. I just need a guy who's good at gears. I need a guy who's good at um, machining. I need a girl who's good at uh, design for manufacturing. Like, I don't need them to be roboticists. I actually need them to be mechanical engineers more than anything. And so at the early stages of a company, you'll see a lot more roboticists than generalists. At the later stages of a company, you'll start to see more specialists come into play. But it's it's not about it's not always about building a career in robotics unless you really want to like design robots from a holistic point of view. But being part of a robotics company can be anything from an ERP specialist to a production manager to a mechanical engineer. Uh, does your company have? Yeah, no problem. Does your company have internship opportunities for students? Yes, we do. Uh, they're on our website every so often. Uh, I just finished up one round of internships. Uh, I might have another round of internships starting in January-ish. Um, uh, they, they come up and they come down. They're, they're always on our careers page, though, so that's the best place to find it. Um, I'm going to jump over to sure. some verbal questions now. Uh, so I think due to time constraints, we need to wind up the session right now. OK, perfect. Uh, any any last things that we want to talk about or uh, I think we need to wind up the session because of time constraints. So hello everyone. I on behalf of IEEE EMBS would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to Sir for taking out time from his busy schedule to grace this event. Through this event, we got to know so many new things which we would be carrying forward with us in future. Thank you, sir, for inspiring and encouraging us with your knowledge. It was indeed a pleasure to have you for this event. I would also like to thank all the participants for your active participation and cooperation. Thank you for making this event a success. Please do follow our EMBA social media handles to keep yourself updated with such innovative and exciting events in the future. Thank you, sir, once again. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, 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 sir.